Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Chuck C. and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Hi. I don't know uh, when I have felt uh, any more grateful than I do tonight. This gang that has come down here to hear me bark for about six sections officially and 16 unofficially. <laughs> There's something else. And it's a great tribute to me for those of you who came down here to listen. And for those of you who came down here to get away from your wives, <laughs> I thank you for coming too. <laughs> But it's, uh, it's a beautiful sight standing here and looking at you. You're a great bunch. And I love you. This has been an eventful week so far. I had to give a uh, funeral on Monday in Pasadena. Chap who was 51 and who was Getting an AA pitch, and right in the middle of it, he went down and didn't get up. Hard to say. And so that was Monday and Tuesday. I had another one. This was one of the original members of the Compton group. Came in just after it was started. Old Tex Mullis. And Tex had been sober for 21 years. And uh, he did it sort of the hard way because he was a compulsive gambler, too. He loved to gamble. And he won and lost once in a while. The last time I knew him to be in Las Vegas, he won $17,000 on the crap table. Took it up to his wife and said, now you send us home. And she didn't. She put it in the safe in the hotel. And he lost the boat before he got out of the place. So it wasn't too bad for him because he thought that was a great joke. He blamed his wife entirely because <laughs> he told her to turn it home. <clears throat> well, this time he went up again. And... uh he left with a heart attack. So I'd uh, put him away on Tuesday. Wednesday, I got my 29th birthday cake, which is something for a tongue-chewing, babbling idiot drunk. 29 years without a drink of pill. And that was pretty nice. And here to finish the week out, I have you people to share with and to be shared with. And I'm, again, very grateful to you for coming. I thought tonight we might just uh, think a little about the problem to get started. This retreat is supposed to be in all of our affairs. The 12 Steps says, having had a spiritual awakening, as the result of these steps, meaning the first 11, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and practice these principles in all of our affairs. In all of our affairs. And thinking a little about the problem, I have to think a little about a Texan who uh, was the first chap that sobered up in 
Houston. He has, I guess, close to, if not already, 35 years of sobriety. He's uh, half a Texan wide and a uh, Texan a half tall. <laughs> and he tells the story. He said if you're going to solve a problem, it helps if you know what the problem is. <laughs> For instance, says he, I've always been afraid of dogs. He says, uh, some little old girl come walking down the sidewalk with a great Dane on the leash and says she's not afraid of him at all. Says a poodle runs out and I take off. And he's that high, you know. <laughs> I can just see him running from the poodle. And he says this caused him a lot of embarrassment in his life. And it finally became necessary for him to look at the reason that he was afraid of dogs. And he looked and looked, and he started to turn the pages of his life back, and he got clear back to where he was seven years old. And he remembered that when he was seven, a little uh, a dog bit him. And that was the reason he was for a dog. But he said that didn't completely satisfy him. And so he looked at it again, and he saw that the reason the dog bit him was that he was chasing a little girl at the time. Now, says he, all my life, I've been chasing women and getting in trouble and running from dogs, and dogs never were my problem in the first place. <laughs> so he says it helps to know the problem. <clears throat> and I think it helps to know the problem. And I'm going to tell you what I think the problem is. And I'm going to tell you what I think the solution is. And there'll be some of you that will not agree with my thinking, and that's perfectly all right. But if I talk, I have to say it as I see it. So, our immediate problem when we came here was booze. Alcohol. That's the thing that ran us in here. It ran me in in a hurry after 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> because I had used every resource I had. And I had lost the battle. So I got here at the ripe old age of 43, a failure in every department of life. Failure as a husband, a father, a businessman, a man, and a drunk. And I had run out of everything, including people, places, things, money, whiskey, and home, and everything else. And there wasn't any place else for me to go but here. However, on my last trip out, I had a very great good fortune. The bottle killed me. The bottle beat me to death, beat me into total and absolute nothingness. And only then could I come to investigate alcoholic anonymous. Up until that time, there was no way that anybody could have talked me into coming here. As long as I had the power of choice, my choice was never to come to Alcoholics Anonymous and never came until I'd lost everything, including the power of choice. And so, I would say to you right off the bat that the greatest single event that has ever happened in my life, and I'm 72 years old, happened in January 1946 when the bottle beat me to death. Had it been necessary for me to consciously surrender, the first time I would have died without coming to this program. 
There was no way that I could surrender. I had never admitted defeat one time in 43 years of life, not the God, man, woman, or the devil. The word surrender wasn't in my vocabulary. It had been bred out of me for generations. So, thank God. On my last trip out, they bottled it for me. The roadblock was burned out. And I got to the program in a state of total ab abandonment of self. When I got here. And everything in the fifth chapter of this book was something I wanted to do the first time I ever heard it. The very first night when I heard this thing led. Everything in it was something I wanted to do. And I'm certain it was because of the total state of abandonment of self in which I got here. Now, there was one thing that I didn't think I could do. And that was step three. And it wasn't because I didn't want to. I had no objection to step three. I would have turned my will and my life over to a jackass if I could have gotten rid of me. But where it says we made a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God, as we understood him, I didn't think that this was possible for anybody like me <coughs> because I did, didn't think it was cricket to believe that I could give the mess that was me to anybody, let alone to God. I wouldn't have taken me with a large dowry, and I didn't figure God liked me any better than I did, and I hated my guts. So I let it lay. I just let it lay. Picked up the last third of step 12 and practice these principles in all of our affairs. Now, after attending a meeting every night for six months, I discovered that I was sober and had been without a drink or a pill for six months, which was quite a discovery because I had attended every one of those meetings with a great fear upon me that I couldn't have this thing, that I didn't have enough left physically or mentally to get it. And after six months of a meeting every night, I discover that I'm sober and have been all the time. And at that time, I started giving a little attention to step three. Because I was thinking, well, maybe there's some way that... Uh, I could come to feel that God would take a package like mine. And I couldn't, I couldn't uh, get any solution to the thing. I was messing with it for quite a little while. And finally, it occurred to me, your father. And then, I started conjuring up the most heinous crimes I could imagine and laying them on these two boys of mine. And I let my imagination go crazy, building the worst possible kind of crimes that anybody could perpetrate. And when I got that done, I would say to myself, now, would this keep me from wanting to see my boys? Would these things make me want to cast them into perdition, to burn for eternity? And I had to say, no, no. I couldn't do it. No way could I, regardless of what they did, 
no way could I assign them to hell. And so I came to believe that maybe uh, the Heavenly Father, being a good guy, you know, and me an evil one, maybe he would uh, forgive me. And I uh, got comfortable. But it had to come through that kind of procedure with me. Now, the funny part of it is, That when I got, when I discovered that I'd been sober for six months, I had to get lost in trying to give this thing to alcoholics because they'd given it to me, drunks. I'd given it to me. And I lost myself working with drunks. And after a while, I had another discovery. And that was that something had happened in our household. A year before, Mr. C was divorced from me. The kids wouldn't come home when I was around. The boss man was going to throw me through the window if I ever stepped foot in the plant again. I had no health, no sanity, no home, no job, no nothing. And it appeared that the war was over. The household was living like kittens. And that was a good discovery. That was about a year after he got here. And another six to eight months went by. And I made another discovery. And that was that I was still trying to clean up my desk at the office. We'll talk a, lot, a little about this when we talk about a in business or practicing these principles in business. But here I was, still trying to clean up my desk at the office. And business was good. It was plum good. And that was a pretty good discovery. Maybe another year went by, and I discovered that the state of my being was better than anything that I had ever dreamed of in my life. My uh, livingness, being itself, was better than anything that I ever dreamed of. And that was a good discovery. And now five, maybe six years have passed. And I made another discovery, which I believe to be the great discovery. When we make this discovery, the search is over and life begins. Life isn't over. Life just begins. Really. And this discovery was that I was never alone anymore. I, who had walked alone for 43 years, Totally alone. I was never alone anymore. I had a God of my very own. And where I am, He is. I'm often by myself, but never alone. And this has been the way it's been ever since the discovery, and it's the way it was before the discovery. Because I hadn't been, a, been alone since my first meeting. Now, I believe that this program of ours, the Alcoholics Anonymous program, is a program of uncovering, discovering, and discarding. That's the AA program to me. Uncovering, discovering, and discarding. The first nine steps of the program are the uncovering steps. Clearing away the wreckage of the past. 
squeezing us out of ourselves ego-wise to get rid of the human ego temporarily because we never get rid of it totally in my opinion. I am convinced that nobody can honestly take the first nine steps in this program without making the discovery that something has happened and it's, it's, it's very, very terrific. Because when we honestly apply the, apply the first nine steps of this program to me, I apply it to me. At number 10, the ego is temporarily gone. Now I am convinced in my own mind, totally and completely convinced from the toenails to the top of my longest hair, that there's only one problem in this life. One problem that includes all problems. And one answer that includes all answers. Now that's oversimplification, isn't it? One problem that includes all problems and one answer that includes all answers. <laughs> I am totally convinced that the only roadblock between me and you and me and my God is the human ego. The only roadblock there is. I further believe that the best definition you'll ever hear of the human ego is the feeling of conscious separation from. The feeling of conscious separation from. From what? From everything. From God. I like to use three words. Life, good, God. Which to me are synonymous words. Conscious separation. From God. From each other. And eventually from ourselves. That is the thing that says to me, here am I, big me, little me, smart me, dumb me, rich me, poor me, against the whole world. I've got to outthink, outperform, and outmaneuver in order to eat out a miserable living out of an unfriendly universe. <laughs> That's what they laid on me as a kid. The very cliches of life. The little bird gets the worm, the devil takes the hind the most, you gotta be there first to the most. Bill's on that premise. Here am I against the whole world. Gotta out think, out perform, and out maneuver. Consciously separated from each other and from God. Now I think that's the greatest roadblock there is. The only one, as a matter of fact. The only roadblock there is between me and you and me and my God. And that's the human ego. The seat of all the obsessions of the mind. That's where we come from. <clears throat> now, it is also my total conviction that there is no possibility under heaven to satisfy the human ego. It is a divine impossibility. I like to sit up there in my big chair. Many of you have seen it. Some of you have sat in it for a minute, but I won't let you sit in it much longer. <laughs> <laughs> and I look down on top of that little town, Lagoon Beach, beautiful shoreline, 
the channel right straight in front of my church, Avalon, on Catalina Island. It's about, oh, maybe it's from where I live, it might be 34, 35 miles to the island. <clears throat> and I looked down at that water, that channel, and that's 35 miles just at the top of it. It's deep, too. <laughs> and I say to myself, suppose that entire channel was bourbon whiskey. <laughs> now, that's quite a few drinks. <laughs> Would that satisfy my obsession for whiskey? And I have to say no. The whole damn thing could not satisfy my obsession to drink. Because when I get started drinking, before long I'm flat on my back in bed drinking the clock around. And every time I open my eyes, I drink. And there's no way to satisfy that obsession. No way. Now, suppose my obsession had have been for money instead of drinking. How about that? Totally impossible to satisfy an obsession for, for dope. Now, I had a client for many years, lived in Phoenix, he was a Syrian. And the Syrians taught the Jews and the Armenians about business. <laughs> Syrians can starve an Armenian to death. <laughs> and I had this chap, and he'd gone from one head of lettuce to 35 million bucks. And he was uh, one of the poorest men I ever saw. Because, unfortunately, he had a partner in one of his business enterprises, which happened to be oil. And this old boy it was worth one hundred and fifty million. <laughs> and they had a suite the Jonathan Club. Most poor beautiful thing you ever looked at in your life. All paneled with the finest wood in the world. Gun racks, elephant tusks all over it and feet and gazelles and everything else, you know. And when I'd be sitting there with two of them, Eddie was trying to get under the diving force. Poor thing, he had only 35 million. This year was on steel with 150 million. <laughs> <coughs> Poor man. <coughs> Eddie used to say to me, Charlie, I was Charlie in business. How can I be like you? And I'd say, Eddie, you can't. And he'd say, why? I say, Eddie, who needs God if he's got 35 million bucks? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be silly. You can buy anything you want, including women, and you do. And that's one of the Syrians' great uh, illusions. They think that God's just a woman, and maybe they are. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Not being a woman. But anyhow... Who needs God when he got 35 million bucks? And I said, you go ahead and make 150 million, and it will if you live. Because everything that old boy touched turned to gold. And when you've made 150 million, you will have then found that it won't do for you what you have to have done right here. Then you come to me and say, Charlie, how can I be like you? And I'll tell you, and you can do it, but not until. And he'd say, well, talk to me about it anyway. And we'd drive all over the state of Arizona, talking just like we'd be talking here, you know. But poor Eddie didn't make his 150. He got so many things in his head that it exploded. He was 10 years younger than I. And he's been gone, what, five, six years? He died. It's impossible to satisfy an obsession for money. Suppose my obsession could have been for power. How about that? No possibility. Witness Watergate. 
There was a nice power struggle. You know? It's absolutely impossible to satisfy an obsession for power. If you're president of the United States, no good, because every dictator in the world has more power than our president. Oh, Genghis Khan had more than all of them. <laughs> so, no way. What about women? I started to say sex, but that brings up a bad connotation. <laughs> <laughs> I've been getting invitations lately to go up and talk to the uh, <laughs> deviates. And God bless me, I can hardly make it. I've so, so far, I've been able to, to sort of have some other thing to do or get something else to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's say women. Suppose my obsession had been for women. And supposing Thank you, that I had been the greatest Lothario of all times. And supposing I had captured every trick chick I set out to catch. But one. Not my ego didn't put the army, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Would they satisfy my obsession for women? Uh-uh. This one kills me. The one I can't get kills me dead. So, if you can't beat him, join him. We got to get rid of the obsessions of the mind. And in order to get rid of the obsessions of the mind, we have to be rid of the ego. Because that's where they come from. I want, I don't want, I like, I don't like, I get, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Now, that's the reason that the wording in this book is like it is. There are 452 pictures in the first page and two paragraphs in our chapter five. Boy, there's a lot of things said in that TV. <clears throat> Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed that path. Now I get I hear people get up here and say that they have heard Bill Wilson say that there's one word in the book that he would change if he was doing it again. And that would be to take out the rarely and put in never have we seen a person fail. Who has thoroughly followed our path. <clears throat> well, Bill didn't say that to anybody. Because he knew why he put rarely in there. If he had a said, never have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. I see uh, about four people here at the front table looking right at me. That would have said, oh, they've never seen a failure. Oh, by God, I'll throw them by now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the reason that's really. And Bill did tell me that himself. I happen to know him pretty good. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Now, I heard that read one time, which I think maybe is even better than it's written. Some guy got up here and he read it, Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly enjoyed our path. I think that's terrific. I put in the cranks in that page, you know. It's very good. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this temple program. Usually, men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being rigorously honest with themselves. Being honest with themselves. 
honesty. You follow the path. There's two pitches right there. To be honest and to follow the path. Thoroughly follow the path. They're naturally incapable of, develop, of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. <coughs> now there's a pitch. Grasping and developing. You see, we're people who never were able to settle for status quo. Never in our lives, long before we ever had a drink, we were unable to settle for status quo. Nothing that was normal ever merited our attention for more than a split second. If it wasn't better than normal, we didn't like it. And that's before we ever had a drink. So, we had better jolly well grasp and develop. Because a happy sobriety will turn into a drunk unless we develop. We've got to walk. We've got to keep going. All we need to do is get fat and complacent and quit walking and we're in trouble. So grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty is, is a whole weekend. They are such unfortunates, they're not at fault, they seem to have been born that way. That's a line that I get the hell out of there. I don't like that line, because in 29 years, I have had, I don't know, probably 500 people tell me that they're sure that they're naturally capable. <laughs> I'm being honest with themselves, naturally, incapable of it. Well, I'm sure that if you're still breathing... <clears throat> There's, uh, and you don't have a, two or three of those wheels missing entirely. There's no way that you can hide behind that, but it's, it's sort of a thing that we use once in a while. <clears throat> Their chances are less than average. They're those two who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders. But many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. i got to tell you a little story. Many of you have heard it, I'm sure. But in the early days in Los Angeles, we didn't have any body out here that ever attended an AA meeting. And uh, a Jewish gentleman came out here with a book. He didn't know he had it. He uh, came to in Palm Springs, and he started looking for his luggage for some whiskey, and he found this book. That's the first edition I read. And he didn't know how it got into his suitcase, but he didn't have any whiskey, and so he read it. And he just kept reading it, and he uh, liked it. He liked what he read. And he came into Los Angeles with this book, and he got a hold of some people, and they started a meeting. And uh, they didn't know how to start a meeting. And so the custom that has spread pretty well all over the world was established right here in Los Angeles. First meeting. That's reading a portion of chapter 5. This Jewish boy says, I don't know why I started me. But he says there's a chapter in this book entitled How It Works. And it gives us a thing. And let's read it. And they read this portion of chapter 5. And you'd be surprised how much of the world that's covered up until now. They do it in Australia. They do it in New Zealand. They do it in Canada. They do it in Texas. It's bad for them down there. <laughs> you read a, 
a uh, conference in uh, Oklahoma City. And there's a lot of Texans up there, you know. One of these Texans says, uh, Oklahoma is just an outlying portion of Texas. He says, outlying hell, he says, you're the worst liars in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, <coughs> they read this all over, and it's beautiful. Every time I read it, it reminds me that my survival depends on this thing right here. Now, a little bit later, this bunch, maybe the half a dozen of them at this time, got a hold of an old boy off Skid Row. His name was Whitey. And Whitey had been a little bit too close and too long with Vino. And he babbled all through the meeting. He'd just sit there and babble. And he was bothering him. So they decided they ought to take him to the doctor and see what was matter with him. So they did. They took Whitey to the doctor, and this doctor took a few quick passes out of him, and he says, boys, give him up. It's this one you can't help. Spend your time on somebody that's got a chance. But he has such bad brain damage that you're just wasting your time. And so the next meeting, of course, they had a discussion about Whitey. And the whole gang of them wanted to uh, dump Whitey, yeah, keep him from interrupting the procedure with his babbling. And of course, there was one guy there that uh, had read something in the book. And he said, wait a minute, boys. He says, it says right here that the only requirement for sobriety is a desire to stop drinking. And Whitey wants to get sober. And we can kick him out. And they said, that's right. That's what it said. And he didn't kick Whitey out. And it's a matter of medical record and a record that one year later, Whitey was accepted in the United States Marines. There's a miracle here. There are those who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of these do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our story is disclosed in a general way, what we used to be like, what happened, and what we're like now. If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, any length to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. Why are those phrases in there? Why do we go clear back here in the First, first line of the second paragraph, chapter three. And we read a line that says, we learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves. That we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. Why? Why is that true back here? First line of the second paragraph, chapter three. Program of recovery is over here in five. It's there because if we be alcoholic, we are caught in a trap we cannot spring. We have to have help. And we can't get help until we recognize the need for it. It's impossible. We're a peculiar breed of cat. We can't hear it, we can hear it, we can't see it, we can see it. And don't make a bit of difference who's talking. For instance, a number of years back in the state of Virginia, I spent a good deal of time with a great celebrity, films and TV, and he and his wife were both out. And I was very fond of them, and I was very hopeful that something was going to happen. And we sat for almost all day in Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. And this guy's wife, everything I said. She said, why? That's the way I live. I've known that forever. 
And I talk a little while longer. But she says, hey, that's the way we raised our kids. This is not new to us. We know the whole thing. And it went that way all the morning. Well, they didn't know that I knew that they'd just gotten out of managers. <laughs> Both of them. <laughs> managers, for those of you who don't know, the booby hatch. <laughs> <laughs> that they knew this all backwards and forwards and through the middle. But they never heard it. And they didn't hear it when I said it either. And you're going to hear a lot of things that you think you know this weekend. Maybe you do. You may hear a lot of things that you disagree with. That's all right with me too. If you disagree with them and know why you disagree with them, maybe you should be up here and be back there. <laughs> But that's the way it's that's the way it's gonna be. The second condition, of course, is that sobriety has to come first. If you've decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, that's top man on the totem pole. And I'm one who believes that unless and or until sobriety comes first, we can't have it. And unless it remains first, we cannot keep it. <clears throat> That's what it says here. This is very, very positive stuff. And are willing to go to any length to get us in your ready to fix Some of these we bought, we thought we'd find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all the earnestness that our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. This isn't a headache we're talking about. We're talking about a terminal illness. A disease of alcohol. A terminal illness. That's why he did it. Because we can't help. we got to recognize the need for it before we can get it, and it's got to be tops. Top man on the totem pole. Somehow they have tried to hold on to their old ideas and results would nail until we let go absolutely. <coughs> Doesn't say half measures available to six percent. Ten percent measures available to ten percent. It says half measures available to nothing. Not a thing. We stood at the turning point. We asked his protection and care of complete abandonment. We let go absolutely. Sit up here without help is too much for us. But there is one who had all power that one in God. May you find him now. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Now this is our problem. We're caught in a trap we cannot spring. We've already been to human help. The first time I heard these steps, one and two were since. I knew that I'd lost the battle of life. I didn't know anything about alcoholism, but I knew I'd lost the battle of life. And I knew that my life was unmanageable by me, and I still know it, and it's never changed. It's still unmanageable by me. No problem to me. Two-fold admission of defeat in the first one. An admission that we're not in the second. Now, there are two big steps for an alky. The first two. Lost the battle of life, number one. You're nuts, number two. <laughs> so you need help and you need it bad. And if you're like me, you've been the preacher, the priest. The doctor, the guy that knows more psychiatry than there is before you ever got to that place. Two, step three. And so you know you need help. And you can't get it from human power. So we make a decision to turn the world and lie to the spirit of God. 
Now, this is one of the things that we're going to be spending time on. This is the most fantastic thing on the face of the earth. There is nothing that will compare with it. The thing that happens to us when we do this, not when we read it, when we do it, to abandon ourselves completely is a simple program. Throw them out. <laughs> Welcome, gentlemen. We made a decision to turn the will and our lives over to care Now, I don't suppose that there's a man in this room that analyzed himself and decided to turn himself into Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I don't believe there's one of you, no bunch, that did that. If there had been any way under heaven for me to remain in left field, I'd still be out there. We are not the kind of people that run around surrendering on every other street corner. <laughs> that isn't our uh, way of doing things. And here we have, we've lost the battle of life and we're nuts and we have to have help. <laughs> now, I told you a little bit ago that the greatest single event in my life up until now, and I'm 72 years old, was when the bottle killed me in January 41. 40, January 46. <clears throat> I was 43. I had read Jack Alexander's article in the Post in March of 41. Mr. Seed found it, read it, Open to the right place and put it on the arm of the chair. I sit in right now. <laughs> and when I got home, I read it. I was four sheets in the wind when I read it. And I suspect I thought that was really real good for you people that need it. I imagine I did. But five years later, when I came to after a four weeks blackout, My last drunk started on the Friday before Christmas, 1945. And I came to sometime after the middle of January, 46. And I don't remember that the time was that the calendar said it had been. And during that four weeks, the thing that had stopped me was burned out. And I accepted the fact that everything dear to me in life was gone and should be gone and that I was not entitled to have it back. That was including my wife and my kids and my home and my job and my health and my sanity and my money. It was all gone. <laughs> and I wasn't entitled to have it back. I knew it was going to die because I'd come within an ace of it the next to the last time out. I'd fallen over on my face and floor in the kitchen, turned blue, and they'd had to get the oxygen squad to wake me up. And the doctor that was with him told me after I came to that to all intents and purposes I was dead 
that they'd had a hell of a time bringing me back. And that they would, nobody would ever be able to bring me back again under those circumstances. And, says he, if I were you, I wouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> Said that right to me. <laughs> but I heard it again. So I knew I was going to die, and I accepted that too. But I didn't want to die with a record. Now I want you to listen to this, because this is a little bit different than a lot of things that happen. I didn't even want sobriety for myself, because I knew I was going to die. I didn't want nothing for me. But I didn't want to die with a record. I didn't want Mr. C and the kids to remember me as nothing but a tongue-chewing, babbling idiot drunk. And in the depths of this thing, I remembered that I'd read the article in the Saturday Evening Post. And the only two things I remembered about it was that drunks helped drunks and didn't drink. And they called it Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said to myself, if I ever live to get out of this bed, I will find Alcoholics Anonymous. And immediately the cur curtain dropped. Just like that. Bang, it dropped. There was no more sanity. I was sick to death, drunk, and insane. And I had a lot of dying to do. But from the moment of commitment until right now, I've never had a drink of pill. Now this is one of the reasons that I believe so completely and totally that there's only one roadblock between me and you and me and God. And that's the human ego. The only roadblock there is. Because, you see, I sit in the same chair today that I sat in for ten years in hell. The same chair. And I sat in it for 29 years in heaven. Nothing happened to the chair. Nothing happened to my wife. Nothing happened to the kids. Something happened to me. And it proves that heaven was always in that chair. I was in hell. But heaven was always in that chair. But nothing happened to you, and I'm still in it. Still in heaven. So, that's the reason that he, these, these statements are so very, very positive. To abandon ourselves completely. To the let go absolutely, it says. And to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. Now this is the problem. <laughs> Something has to happen that we get rid of the obsession of the mind. And that's what this program of ours is all about. The American Medical Society, we have some of the most <coughs> Illumined members right here. <laughs> American Medical Society says alcoholism is a disease. It has symptoms. It is treatable but not curable. And the only way an alcoholic can successfully live is not to take the next slug. But they cannot tell us how not to take the next slug. They can't tell us how. That's what this book is all about. To tell us how. To get rid of the obsessions of the mind that cause us to drink. That's what this whole program is all about. To rid us of the obsessions of the mind that cause us to drink. Now, why am I not drunk tonight? 
a good question. I'm a tongue-chewing, babbling idiot drunk. Why am I not drunk tonight? This is Friday. <laughs> Thursday night's kick-off night, right? <laughs> You fly on the machine on Thursday? You get in high gear on Friday? You pay Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Sober up Sunday. Taper off so you can go to work Monday. Some Sunday you taper off so you can go to work some Monday. Why am I not drunk tonight? Because I have the thing I was looking for in the bottle. And that's the only reason I'm not drunk. That's the only reason I'm not drunk. I had the thing I was looking for in the bottle. Now, what is the thing? <laughs> that king size hurt is gone. You know the king size hurt. The kids uh, call it that hole in their guts when they're standing on the street corner and the wind's blowing through. That's what the kids call it. When I first heard him say that, I said, yeah, they don't, they, they've been to a meeting somebody. They heard that. They stole it from somebody that knew what he was talking about. But that ain't right. <laughs> I learned that that ain't right. They were the guys that coined it. Standing on the street corner with a big hole in their guts and that wind blowing through. Big hurt. That's gone. I'm not fighting me or you or life or God or the devil. I am at peace with me and with you and with my very own God. And that's the only reason I'm not drunk. When I say I am an alcoholic, it means this. That I cannot live and drink. And of myself, I cannot keep from drinking. And that's just as true right now as it was 30 years ago. <laughs> that's step one, so as we admitted, we were powerless over alcohol, that lies had become unmanageable by us. And I've looked all the way through this and through the manuscript from which this was written and through, through the most recent book that was printed, and there's nothing in any one of them that says that if I'm sober 10 or 12 or 29 years, my life will become manageable by me. They don't say that. I look <laughs> not in there. <laughs> and furthermore, there's nothing in my experience in 29 years. That would indicate that my life will ever be manageable by me again. But thank God it is no problem to me because I have step 11. I have lived by step 11 for 29 years. So through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood it. Praying only for knowledge of his will for us and power to carry it out. I have lived in two inspectants of guidance and direction for 29 years. And I get it. And you might say, how do you know? I've got the simplest rule in the world. I never had it so good. This is the only good life I've ever known, the only easy life that's ever been mine in my entire lifetime. And I've got 29 years to look over sober without a drink or pill. 25 years drunk or drinking. Now, 19 years before that. And this is the only good life I've ever known, the only easy life that's ever been mine. So I highly recommend it. This is the way to get rid of the obsessions of mind. Here are the steps we took. We're sober. Now, don't say here are the steps we read or heard read or learned by heart. Don't say that. Don't say here the steps we interpreted. You can can find that in here. Don't say that. Don't say here the steps we con God into taking for us. There have been a few people around this 
neck of the woods that uh, were experts on interpreting. That's that. There's one guy out in the valley there for a while. They were selling interpretation of the theft and teaching interpretation of the theft. And then I got drunk. <laughs> His business went down the rat hole. Don't say that. It says you're the steps we took. And the reason we have to take them is because we're caught in a trap we can't spring. We have to have help and can't get help until we recognize the need for it. Now, going on down to to step nine, and I've just got time, uh, Mr. I won't mention his name, but his initials are Johnny Green, Sr. <laughs> he said he was sleepy when he came in, and if I thought a second after 9.30, that he was going to sleep right on the table there and start snoring. So I got to quit. <laughs> but very quickly, the first three steps are decisions. The fourth and fifth are action steps. We made a searching trail of moral inventory of ourselves. We write it, the book says very, very specifically that it's good to write, write the thing down. We're more apt to do it by it if we write it. Takes a little longer. It's good for us. So we write it. That's a moral inventory. So we don't have to write every time we turn left when we should, should have turned right. It don't mean that we have to put down everything we ever stole. Or every lie we ever told or every time we ever got drunk. <clears throat> they don't, that does not what it means. It means to write down enough that we can see the motivation for what we have done up until now. The motivating force in our lives. And of course, if we want to get real simple, the whole thing will boil down to obsessions of the mind, which is the ego. Every one of them will boil down to trying to satisfy the human ego, which cannot be done. So we write it down and then we share it. Share it with God, ourselves, and another human being. The other human being is the uh, thing that really uh, sets us up <laughs> for the kill. I can admit to God and to myself hidden the privy. You know, nobody knows but me and God. But I've had to spread this dirty linen out before another human being. Man, if you got any ego left after that, you ain't done it. <laughs> That's an ego buster. And so we've written it and shared it, and now we've become willing to give it away, and we give it away. Again, we got two action steps in there. These, these, these next two are not action steps. There are, again, decisions. Now I find people all over the world beating their brains out, trying to get rid of their obsessions of mind. Their defects of character. I bet you there have been a million hours spent in arguing over why step six has... We're entirely ready to... Have God remove all these defects of character, and step seven says, humbly ask him to remove her shortcomings. And there have been a million hours spent on what's the difference between shortcomings and defects of character. You know, there's supposed to be a difference. I asked Bill. He says, I don't know. He says, I think I didn't want to end two lines right next to each other. It's the same words. <laughs> He says he means the same thing. <laughs> so that's going to knock a lot of arguments out, isn't it? But the main thing is that we become willing to give them away and we give them away. 
we don't do these things, if we could have done away with our defects of character, we would have done it before we came here. I wasn't just jumping up and kicking my heels together then. Goody, goody, I get to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm sure my mother didn't raise me to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. She's 96 and she don't believe it yet. <laughs> She's still around. I say I've had... 29 years without a drunk, a drink, and she's never had my little juice. What's so hard about that? <laughs> so, we become willing to give them away, and we give them away. And then we've got two more in the first ten. Two of the greatest ones left yet. The most immediately effective steps in the whole program. Or eight and nine. We made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Made direct amends to such people wherever possible. Except one to do so would injure them or others. If you haven't done that, do it. Do it, do it, do it. Quick. The weight of the world is removed from your shoulders when you honestly take care of eight and nine. And I'm going to tell you this little story and uh, it won't take that long. I'll still get down. One time, many of you have heard it, but it, it curls my hair, yet. About ten years ago, I got a call on a Friday night, just like this, from a guy in Whittier. And he says, Chuck, I'm sitting here with six gun in my lap, and I'm going to blow my brains out. But he says, Jim, says, don't shoot yourself until you've talked to Chuck, Chuck C. And he gave me your number. And I'm called and I'm ready to talk. So what do you got to say? <laughs> and I said, you called on a bad night. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm talking tonight, tomorrow night, and Sunday night. But Monday night's open. So if you want to see me come down Monday night, and if you don't, blow your brains out. And that's exactly what I told you. And at 7.30, Monday evening, the doorbell rang. And in came my boy. Now, let me tell you a little story here uh, within a story. This Jim was Jim Willis. And Jim Willis was Sybil's husband for many years. Sybil was 14 years in our central office. And Jim was a compulsive gambler. And Jim started the Gambler's Anonymous thing and wrote their book. And he'd already done that, and then he became an alcoholic. And he called me one time, said, come get me. And I said, where are you? And he was in his office on Pico. And I went and got him. And he got sober. Now, Jim is losing his eyesight. He's sure he and he's sort of a sick man, but he's sober. And I talked with him on the phone just the other day. And he's pretty happy. But anyway, it was this Jim that he told this guy, because he not only was an alcoholic, but he was a compulsive gambler. And Jim had told him to talk to me before he blew his brains out. Well, here he was. And we started talking. Now, at 2.30 in the morning, we were right where we are now, at 8 and 9. And I was telling this monkey, now, here's what you got to do. See, he lost a lot of money that he didn't have. And he had lost it to professional gamblers. And that ain't a very healthy <laughs> situation. <laughs> it don't... It don't do much for longevity. <laughs> So here he sits, and I'm saying, now listen, here's what you got to do. And you got to go to these people and say, look, I am not the big shot I would have had you believe. I'm an alcoholic. And I found a way to live, to live that might let me live one day at a time without a drink for the rest of my life. And one of its conditions is we got to make amends, and that's why I'm here. Now, see, I admit the debt. 
I said that I was going to, you know, this is what he had to do. You go to him and say to him, I admit the debt. I'll give you the money. And I'll pay you as soon as I can. But I ain't got no money now. Why is the truck you can't do that? You'll kill me. And I said, so what? You won't have suicide on your mind. <laughs> And the old boy started to laugh, and he's still laughing. And he's walking the streets free, man. Ever since the, he was laughing right over the hill, you know, and he left me. And he never quit. And he paid him off. Nobody killed him. So one of these things, so if you haven't done eight and nine, do them. The weight of the world goes right off your back when you do them. Now, finish up. Alcoholism cuts across our society from the highest to the lowest. We are peoples of all professions, all states of poverty and riches, priests and preachers from all denominations. We have in this deal. We have world scholars amongst us. Bankers. No one of whom would have come here if they could have stayed out. So, we have a problem that you and I cannot solve. We have to have help. And those first nine steps will roll away the stone because those are the surrender steps. The surrender steps. Surrender is the thing that opens the door, that allows us to get the help. Because God himself cannot help us until we will allow it. The recognition of the need for help. And the turning of our will and our lives over to the care of God. And the clearing away of the wreckage of the past is the beginning of the tree. It's fantastic. Don't be afraid of it. Now I'm convinced that you and I have to do this without getting too serious about it. We get too serious and nothing happens. If we look too hard, we'll never find. I looked for this thing for 30 years before I got here. And I couldn't find it. I came here not looking for it, and it found me, or we found each other, or something. Wasn't even looking for anything but a way to live one day at a time without drinking. So I could rub out as much of the record as I could. So, I want us to have a lot of fun this weekend. Don't be too serious. You know Rule 62. <laughs> Some people put it on their license plate. Rule 62. It's a good rule. There's a little book about that tall and about that wide, and it's green with covers, and on the front cover it says Rule 62, and you open it up, and you look, and every page in the book is vacant, except there's a double truck in the middle, and it says, don't take yourself so goddamn seriously. <laughs> And that's what we want to do here this weekend. Have a lot of fun. Not get too serious. But realize the problem that we have that we cannot handle on our own. And to come to see totally before this weekend is over 
that what I can't do, we can do. With the grace of God. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.